So what it's going to do is, is when that platform gets out here, it's going to put that chair uh, out over the edge where you guys are standing. So there's no place in this observatory that he could not be comfortably sitting in that chair uh, observing through the uh, through the telescope. Would you have to reference something else? Now, the last real science done with this telescope was back in the 1960s when we were preparing for the man on the moon. The astronauts, when they came back, at the, at the very least, needed to be able to tell us that the, uh, what made the crater, if you and I can see, with the naked eye on the moon. Were they formed by something that had impacted the surface of the moon, or were they volcanic in, in nature? Now, if you're familiar with the Flagstaff area, we have about 45 minutes out on Highway 40, around Winslow, we have the best example in the world of an impact crater, and that, of course, being meteor crater. Uh, we're surrounded by volcanoes, so just in this little neck of the woods, we had all the geology that the astronauts need to study. And indeed, all the Apollo astronauts spent a lot of time uh, in this area here with a hammer in hand, cracking open rocks, learning what was important to tell the stories. Uh, what was important to bring back with them, but equally important what needed to be stay on the moon surface. Okay. So, uh, in addition to that, many of the maps that NASA were using in their computers and, and the guidance uh, systems were taken uh, through photographs uh, from this very telescope uh, right here. So, uh, Mom, uh, this is a very historical uh, spot that she did touch that uh, Neil Armstrong had his hands right here. <laughs> because when they got done playing around with rocks, they'd come here at nighttime, look through this telescope, very telescope, at the sites where they were going to put down on the, on the moon surface. Okay. Now, uh, today this is used for public viewing. And as I mentioned before, you come back here tonight, you're going to be doing that. Uh, we can't see anything here in the daytime, but let's assume that that's what you're here for right now, is to look through the uh, telescope. Now, the first thing we're going to have to do is get in line with those black shutters at the top of the roof. Those, those are going to open up and that's going to be our only access to, 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 to the night sky. Now, we've already <coughs> seen where we need to move the telescope at times to accomplish that. However, we can also... Okay, now I want you to put that button down. Okay. I would defy you to find any other observatory that has that. Well, what kind of wheels are they? Those are 1954 Ford truck tires. <laughs> okay. Now, when, when this dome first arrived, it was covered with canvas, and it was light enough that one individual with a rope attached to it could actually drag the, the uh, dome in the position he wanted. Now, this <coughs> is, didn't have electric motors back then, so that was the only way they could move it. Now, because of our winters we have here in Flagstaff, you know, last year we got 12 feet of snow. So you can imagine what that does to the canvas roof. <laughs> so they soon uh, realized that they were going to have to fortify it, so they added that planking. Okay, this was back in the, in the uh, 1890s. They added that planking, and then they covered it with tin to waterproof it. Now, all of a sudden, the weight of this jumped up to 28 tons. And believe me, that guy with the rope wasn't pulling the dome anymore. <laughs> so, and, and actually, in 1899, the director uh, decided that he was going to solve the problem by actually floating the dome on water. Now, you can imagine, they attached circular tanks all on the top of the walls. They filled it full of salt water so it wouldn't freeze at night. Jacked the dome up and attached wooden pontoon floats to the base of the dome and then gently set it back down into the water tank. It was an absolute ingenious idea. It worked brilliantly. Mm -hmm. You could now back one guy with the rope could pull the dome in any position they wanted to. Okay. Now, I say it act brilliantly, but that was for about five days. <laughs> hmm. We started spraying leaks. The, the temperature out here, is, you know, between night and daytime is such a contrast that the seams on the tanks were constantly expanding and contracting, hmm. and we couldn't keep the water in them. They fought the system, they thought they'd cover it with copper, might make it a little more pliable, but that didn't work. And finally, after about four or five months, they had to jerk it, up, jerk it down and, and start over again. Um, 
But uh, look on the walls over there, you can still see the stains from the failed attempt to float the dome on, on water. Okay. Well, finally, in 1960, he decided that he was going to solve this problem once for all, and he gave us enough money to install that system. So, like I say, I now of course recognize the fact that since those are tires, eventually we get a flat. So we have, have to take that oscillation ladder and, and position it underneath the tire and, and climb up and take the tire off and fix it and put it back up again. <laughs> now, if the tire wears out though, which they will over time, we have a really big problem. Because today, where are you going to find 1954 Ford truck out? <coughs> now, we are fortunate though that we have to kind of a crossroad. We have Interstate 17 coming up from the south. And, and we have 40 point east and west, right? So we get a lot of antique car shoe shows coming through town. <coughs> now, if just by chance, <coughs> and if you are involved in that particular enterprise, and if you're driving a 1954 Ford truck, uh, we offer you free parking overnight here in the little parking lot. <laughs> 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 okay. Any questions about the any questions about the stuff? So what were you saying though between the water? They, they put the tire system in in 1960, and the water thing was in what year was that? 1899. So what did they do between that time? Well, uh, they, they, at this point, they were starting to get electric motors, so that, that made it oh. a little easier. Okay. Uh, but at that point, it was actually mounted on about 20 of those uh, steel wheels that right on the top of it. So, but you know, but they never could get the motor strong enough, and, and it, they were constantly wearing out very quickly. So uh, it was really a problem. Okay. Any other so questions? What kind of a motor has to power this now? So Still a pretty strong one or not? Yeah, there's, three, there's actually three of them. There's one located right up here, right over there, and right over there. You can, hey, you notice on, the, notice on the wall over there, you see all those outlets? Uh-huh. When they got the first, they had one electric motor when they first got it, it was attached to a wire that had plug on the end of it. So they, they, would, they would plug it into the wall socket and then thing would move. <coughs> and it would move until it got to the extent of the wire and then they'd have to unplug it and they'd have to jump to the next one. <laughs> <floor. laughs> and plug it back in again. And work it around where they wanted to go. So funny. Okay, well, I've got. Uh, now, you might have noticed these smaller telescopes on this and wonder what they are. Now, these are called finder scopes or guide scopes. Now, look at Mars. You know, Mars is just a, just a little speck in the sky. And I take a bite, when I look through the telescope, I'm actually taking a bite out of the sky equivalent to about half my little finger there. How difficult it is to use a telescope pointing at that particular spot. The last thing I'm going to do is put my eye down here and then start moving the telescope around to try to find the planet. So what they do instead is look through these smaller scopes. Now these smaller scopes don't magnify very much, but I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in taking a nice big easy bite out of the sky. And I, I get Mars in there. These have crosshairs on in them, so they're aiming devices. I put that crosshair on the planet. And if it's calibrated correctly, Mars should be fairly close to being centered in my eyepiece. Okay, does that make sense? It's about a two or three step process. Now, uh, these things, I have glass lenses, or, or glass lenses, so consequently I have desk covers. Uh, here, I got some, one more thing to do. Okay. Pull, see that little toggle switch? Pull, pull that right there. Oh, something happened. Oh, oh. oh. Glass lens. 
And, and about 50 years ago, the, the, this, this uh, dust cover on this fell apart. And the director now was faced with the task of finding a replacement. Now, this is before eBay, so he didn't have the opportunity to go on the computer. Mm -hmm. Here's the dust cover on this one computer. fell apart, or the little one? This, this little one right here. Oh, OK. okay. Uh, that one's open? No, it's good. No. Which one? The brass scope. Oh, did you go back in? Oh, no, that's it. That's it. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's just something straight. Uh, so anyway, he, he's, he's, now he's faced with the problem how to fix it. Now he was walking through uh, their kitchen, his wife's in the kitchen, and uh, right in, she apparently was preparing a meal, and she had pulled out different utensils, and right in the middle of this was a 10-inch frying pan. Now we've already got an, an indication of how these guys' minds work, <laughs> so it may not surprise you that he could visualize entirely the new use for a 10-inch uh, skillet. It would make a wonderful, wonderful dust cover. <laughs> <laughs> And that's been up there over 50 years ago, so don't show up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it works. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. It works beautifully. Yeah. So, you know, that's just another example of how high tech we were about. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Thank you very much, you know.